right, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 10. It seems like it's been a long time since we, when I made mention that we were in 1 Samuel today, and uh, I saw a lot of looks of kind of questioning and wondering, really? Uh, yeah, still there. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 14 through 27. Saul has been off on a journey. Where, where had he been? I don't have any more of that, of that, of this week's. Where had Saul been? He went off on a journey. Where did he go? Hunting. Hunting what? Donkeys. Boy, have you ever heard of that? Boy, my mother would go crazy. Where are you going, Vic? I'm going to hunt donkeys. Uh, why was he going to hunt donkeys? Yes, his father's donkeys were lost. Uh, uh, they spent about three days. Did they find them during that three-day period? No. It just so happened that he had a who with him? A servant with him, and that servant uh, knew about who? Samuel. Knew that he was going to be in a particular city on this particular day. And he also had what with him? Yeah, he had a little money to give as a gift to uh, the prophet Samuel. And uh, true or false, Samuel told him that the donkeys had been found. Yes. Uh, and he also told him something else. What did he tell him? Ah, yes, you are going to be the king of Israel because the children of Israel had rejected who? God and desired a king in order to be like the nations around them. So that's kind of where we are. And uh, uh, so now he's about to go back home and uh, some other events are going to occur. Uh, who's got a good outline of 1 Samuel 14, I mean chapter 10, 14 through 27? Anybody? I know Larry does. Go for it, Larry. I don't know if it's good or not. Oh, it's good. <laughs> uh, Saul questioned by his uncle. Okay. People gathered to hear God's blessings. Okay. Selection of the new king. All right. And response to the new king. Oh, very good. Um, anybody else have an outline? <clears throat> I'm on now. I can hear myself. Nobody else. Y'all are just chicken. You either didn't do it or you're chicken. That's all it is to it. Uh, I had four points there. First, Saul converses with his uncle. Uh, when he gets back home, the first person he sees is his uncle, and there's a conversation that ensues with him. Secondly, Saul, Samuel calls Israel. He calls them all together uh, for this huge gathering. Uh, number three, God chooses a king. I find it interesting that God chooses the king. We'll come back and talk about that some more uh, when we get to that section. And then number four, the children of Belial censor the king. Okay? And uh, so we've got a lot to talk about in this chapter. And there's a lot of good lessons that are found therein. Guys, I'm too loud. If somebody can turn that down just a hair, I'm, about, I'm almost echoing in here. <clears throat> I don't know if anybody's going to turn it down or not. Nobody. Guess you're just, you're just going to be loud. There he is. He's going to turn it down. All right. Who asked Samuel and his servant, Whether went ye? Yes, his uncle. We already talked about that. And Saul's uncle said unto him and to his servant, Whither went ye? True or false? We know exactly who this uncle is. False. Guys, this is the only time we ever read about this man in Scripture. Okay, The only time that we read about him. Uh, we don't know uh, whether it came from his mother's side or from his father's side uh, at all. Okay, We just know that it was his uncle. Um, true or false? Samuel told his uncle that they came to Samuel. That's true. And he said, to seek the asses. And when we saw that they were nowhere, we came to Samuel. Wow. Uh, is that a pretty significant point? Who is Samuel right now in Israel? Who is he? Okay, he's a judge of Israel. He's, he's a prophet of the Almighty God and individuals knew him well, right? He, not, not one word had ever fallen to the ground. And he's a what? He's a priest. Folks, this man occupies an extremely high position in the nation of Israel. Okay, so uh, it's not like he's just, you know, not, not only is he a religious figure, he's also a political figure as well. Okay, um, when Samuel's uncle heard that they came to Samuel, what did he then want to know? Yes, and Saul's uncle said, Tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto you. 
We've already mentioned that Samuel was a very predominant figure in Israel. True or false? Do you think very many people came into actual contact with Samuel during the course of their lives? Hmm. You know? Let me ask you this. Uh, how many of you, and I don't care when it's been, in the course of your life, how many of you have actually sat and talked to the President of the United States? Nobody? Well, let's drop it down. How many of you have sat and actually talked to a senator of the United States? Got one, two. Now see, we dropped a level, didn't we? Okay, got three. But still, most of us haven't even talked to a senator. House of Representatives, remember? Okay, we've got a few more there. The lower we go, the more we talk to, right? But the higher that person is, the less people have talked to you. Not one of us. This just shows us how important we are in the United States. You know, not one of us has talked to the president ever in our lives. Okay? And uh, so it was the same way in Israel. Here's this very prominent man. And all of a sudden, Saul's talked to him, hasn't he? And so the uncle, you know, he's definitely going to, boy, you talked to the, the prophet. You've talked to this priest. You've talked to this judge. What did he have to say? Wow. Uh, two, was there a lot going on in Israel at this time? What was going on? It's mainly the king, wasn't it? Guys, there, there's this huge transition going on in Israel, right? God has told Israel what? I'm going to give you one, okay? And they all went back home, and now all of Israel's in anticipation of who this king is, and now Saul has talked to the man closest to who? Closest to God in the nation of Israel. There's no, no doubt that he would ask him, what in the world did he say to you? Man, what did Saul reveal to his uncle? Ah, that's all he said, isn't it? That's all he told him. And Saul said unto his uncle, he told us plainly that the asses were found. That's it. Now, was there more said? Guys, there's a lot more said than that. But that's the only thing he told him. What did he conceal from his uncle? That's the next question. Yes, that he was the king, folks. But of the matter of the kingdom, whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. Now, there's a wonderful lesson right here for a lot of people, okay? Guys, just because you know something does not mean you have to tell it. You know that? And just because you don't tell somebody everything doesn't mean that you're wrong. Okay? I may come in from an elders meeting. Kathleen said, well, what'd y'all talk about? I said, nothing. You want to know why? I mean, I've been there three hours. Sometimes four. Been a couple of five hours. <laughs> You know, she just does not what? She doesn't need to know all that stuff. Okay? It's none of, none of her business. I don't need to trouble her with that information. Uh, there's, there's some things that are confidential. There's some things that are important. There's some things that, you know, she just doesn't need to know. So I just don't tell her. And we need to understand that there are times when we need to conceal information. Okay? Uh, that leads to question number seven on our list. Why do you think he concealed the matter of the kingdom to his uncle? Oh, I've got a bunch of reasons. What do you think? Anybody even think about it? Why? why? The most important thing that he was told, right? Who cares about donkeys if you're going to be the king? Who cares? He was told not to. Nobody would believe him, possibly. You know, uh, that, that's one of the things that Moses was concerned about when he went back to the children of Israel in Egypt, was it? They will not believe me. Okay? Can you, can you imagine you and me walking in and say, Guys, I'm going to run for president. See, you're already laughing. See, everybody just got smiles on their face, giggling, big president. You know, just think Saul comes in. He's just been a tender of sheep, right? And all you go tell his uncle that I'm about to become king? Yeah, right, really. Okay, don't need that hassle, do we? Uh, any other reasons? He might not have understood. Ah, yeah, understood what? That, what that involved, that he was indeed the one. 
Ah, yes, there may have been some vacillating there, right? Uh, it'd, be, it'd be hard to believe. Um, anybody else got reasons? Okay, that's kind of what Larry was saying, you know. Yeah, what's, going to, what's really going to transpire? He had been anointed, hadn't he? Okay, I mean, he had, he had been right there with Samuel, and Samuel anointed him with oil. I mean, he, he, he knew <laughs> from that standpoint, but still, uh, to think of that obligation and that response, you know, can this really be true? Okay, how? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, he, I mean, this little guy's a nobody, right? Uh, he, when, he, when he was told that he would become king, what, what, was his, what was his statements that he made? Well, I'm from the least tribe, and I'm from the least family of the least tribe. Okay? So, it, it'd be difficult. Um, true or false? At this point in Saul's history, he had manifested some very positive qualities in his life. Is that true? Yeah. He was obedient to his father, wasn't he? He uh, was concerned about how his father felt. He had manifested humility when it came to uh, being told that he would become the king. And so maybe he's still manifesting this positive quality of humility, you know. Uh, just because, you know, I've, I've been told I'm going to be king doesn't mean that I have to go out there and just shine uh, among everybody, right? And uh, some people have a hard time doing that, don't they? They have a hard time concealing, uh, you know, any, any greatness or magnificence that might be about them. And, and they love to boast and they love to brag. And right now, Saul's still a pretty humble individual. So that may have been uh, one reason that... Uh, uh, he didn't say it. Uh, we mentioned Saul was still processing the information. Uh, man, can you imagine the pressure it would put upon him to reveal that he was going to be the king? Man, his life would be miserable for, for quite some time. Um, could it have been that he might not have trusted his uncle? You know, we haven't even thought about that, have we? You know, some people just like information so they can what? Go tell it. I ain't telling Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe don't know how to keep his mouth shut. You know, there's some people you know not to tell. So that may have been uh, one of his reasons. Um, I wrote this one down. Since the anointing was done in private, he may have assumed that the time of the revelation was not his to give. And so he would wait for God's time to manifest himself to Israel. And it was soon to come, isn't it? Very quickly to come. But I just find it interesting that the most important thing he was told, he refused to say anything about. Oh, he just told me where the donkeys are. Yeah, right. Okay. Where did Samuel ask for the people of Israel to gather? Mizpah. Okay, Mizpah. Uh, what four things did he tell Israel that God had done for them? Number one. Brought them out of... Egypt, folks, uh, are we several hundred years removed from that day? Yeah, guys, we're several hundred years removed from Israel, and he's still wanting them to remember the day, watch this, of their salvation. Now, guys, is, um, is Israel's deliverance from Egypt a type of our deliverance from sin? Yeah. You want to know the one day you should never forget? The day you were immersed into Christ for the remission of your sins. God delivered you out of the hands of an evil tyrant, did He not? Folks, you need to remember that day. Israel need to remember that day. Most, one of the most important days in Israel's history, the day that Israel brought them out of Egypt. So He reminds them of that. Number two... What else? Brought them out of Egypt, delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. He's saying similar things over and over, right? Number three, delivered them out of the hand of all the kingdoms, right? And number three, delivered them from all oppressors. He's emphasizing the fact that God is their what? He's their deliverer. He's their salvation. And notice the next statement. And ye have this day blanked your God. Rejected. 
Guys, that, that's, that's pretty potent, isn't it? Okay. Uh, had, had he already mentioned in chapter 8 that they had rejected God? Yeah. They have not rejected you, Samuel. They have rejected me that I should not reign over them. Folks, God's not forgetting this. Okay. Look what I've done for you. I've delivered you. I've delivered you out of all kingdoms. I've delivered you out of the hand of all your oppressors. And what have you done to show thanks for me? You've rejected me. That little word rejected. Strong says to spurn, to disappear. It's also translated in our Bibles as abhor, cast away, cast off, contempt, despise, disdain, loathe, melt away, refuse, reject, reprobate, utterly vile person. Brown Driver and Briggs says this, to reject, to despise, to refuse. Here's what's interesting to me. When you look at this little word reject, not only, folks, is there the action of rejection, there's a feeling that's associated with it. Okay? And the feeling is that of disdain. Now, who, who, who are they feeling that toward? Ye have rejected me, your God. Folks, not only do they reject Him, there's this feeling that they have of disdain for God. We don't want God to rule over us. We're tired of God. We're sick of His order. Man, that never happens today though, does it? Folks, there's a lot of times with members of the church, guess what they do? They just reject God, don't they? And folks, there's not just the action of rejection. There's feelings that are down there. I don't care about God anymore. I don't want God anymore. I'm not concerned about God's will. I don't care about God's uh, law and the way He wants me to live. And I, all I want to do is what? I just want to be free from all of that. And so they reject God. And that's what happened on this particular occasion. Um, I put down here also, thus they longed for another they could honor and respect. Who was that? A king. Man, folks, true or false, you and I are always loyal to someone. Always. True. You can't go through life and be loyal to nobody. Okay, your loyalty is somewhere. It may be to self. It may be to Satan. It may be to a false god. It may be to God. But you always are loyal to someone. When Israel rejected God, they ceased that loyalty. And now who do they want to honor? A king like the nations around them. Wow. Pretty serious stuff, isn't it? So before we reject God, we better what? We better give it a lot of consideration. You know what? A lot of consideration. Even though God delivered them from their adversaries and tribulations, number 12, who did Israel desire to be over them? Yes. Who himself saved you out of all your adversaries and your tribulations? And you have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Man, God, I mean man telling God what to do. We're pretty good at that, aren't we? <laughs> oh yeah. And go to him and they could go to God, but they didn't get a verbal answer to whatever it was they wanted. But they both saw they could. Okay, yeah, a lot of times that's the way it is. We we desire something physical. Something we can see, something that's tangible. And uh was Saul a pretty strapping Young man, yeah, stood head and shoulders above the rest of the nation. Very strong individual from a very powerful family, okay? And so uh, um, he, he was a great representative as a king, but he wasn't who? He wasn't God, was he? But yeah, a lot of times individuals uh, do that. Notice this lesson that we can learn here. Notice how that verse began, folks, that... The second part of that verse, who himself saved you out of all your adversaries and your tribulations. But yet you said what? Nay. We'll have a king over us. Sometimes it does not matter how good and gracious God is to us, we still 
do not want Him to reign over us. He can bless and we reject. He delivers us and we disdain Him. Wow. If you focus on what God does for you, it, do we have a lot of blessings? Yeah. Guys, you know, you're just overwhelmed when you really think about all that God has done in our lives, right? But then we quit focusing on that, and what do we focus on? What we want and what we desire and what we long for, and we forget all the wonderful blessings and choose self over God. And that's where Israel was at this particular time. Just kind of sad, isn't it? How are they to present themselves unto the Lord? Yes. Now therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Uh, pretty interesting stuff the way that's worded. By your tribes. How many of them? Twelve tribes. Plus who? Plus Levi. <laughs> Remember, Levi was kind of a unique tribe, right? Okay, Joseph had been divided into how many? Two. Ephraim and Manassas. And Levi was dropped out, sort of, kind of, right, as far as the inheritance of the land is concerned. But he wanted all the tribes there, including who? Including Levi. Okay, so by your tribes. Now watch this. And by your what? Thousands. Guys, God was reminding them that not only are you 12 tribes, your tribes have become what? Thousands. You are now a powerful group of people, okay? Each tribe numbered into the thousands, did they not? And thousands of that. When they went just to get their military men, uh, almost every uh, tribe was able to give 20, 30, 40,000 men uh, militarily. That's just you know men that were of the age to fight. They, they were a huge, powerful nation among all the kingdoms. And who had made them that way? God had. And what were they doing? Rejecting Him. God's just reminding them that uh, you're a powerful nation and I brought you to this point and uh, now you're rejecting me. What tribe was taken from all the tribes in this process? The tribe of Benjamin, yes. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes to of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. What family was taken from the tribe of Benjamin? Yes, yes, Matri. And when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken. Anybody do any research on Matri? Reign of Jehovah, the only time they're mentioned. Okay, never mentioned again in Scripture. Okay. We don't even really fully understand this connection. This, this family may try with Saul and Kish. We don't really you know, understand all the background of that. And uh, one of these days, that'll be one of those questions we can go to God about. Okay. Folks, God, explain this may try person. Who is this? Okay. And I bet you can give you a pretty good description of it. But uh, right now, we just don't understand much of that. Okay, so we've gone from where? We've gone from all of Israel to who? Benjamin, all of Benjamin to Matri, and now we're going to go to a single person, right? What person was taken from the family of Matri? Saul. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. Um, have we ever seen this kind of thing before? Where, where all the Israels gather together and they go down to a tribe, they go down to a family, and they go down to a person. Do y'all ever remember it before? David? Okay. Well, that, that, that would be after. But what about before? Remember the destruction of the city of Jericho? Something was taken. Okay. Some of the accursed things. Okay. That weren't supposed to be taken. And when they went to do battle with Ai, they lost the battle. And they wondered why. And so God gathers all the nation together. And guess what he does? He goes through the process. And they finally find who? Awaken, right? And his family. Man, can you imagine being in that process? You know? And you're, okay, we're about to choose a king. Okay. Benjamin's taken. That, that rule, oh, man, that figures. I'm not going to be king. Okay, I'm from Judah. 
And then all of a sudden, may try to take, oh, man, leaves my family out. Eskews are gone. Okay, don't want no king of the eskews. Okay? And then all of a sudden here, it's who? It's you. Just like Achan. Achan, it's what? It's you. Can you imagine all the eyes on Achan? Achan, what have you done? That we've lost this battle. And now, where are all the eyes? The eyes now are all on who? On Saul. Wow. Can you imagine the shock of all those who knew Saul? His daddy? His friends? His family? His neighbors? Everybody he's grown up with? Everybody he went to school with? All the other tenders of sheep. Who did you just say? Saul. I know him. And you're going to make him what? King? Wow. There's only one problem though. And when they sought him, he could not be blamed. Found. He wasn't there. So guess what? They couldn't see. There were no eyes on him. <laughs> Where was he, folks? That's exactly right. Exactly right. Um, some say he hid out of fear. Some say he hid out of humility. Okay, he, he, Did he know who was going to be the next king? I just find it interesting that here they, he'd, been, he'd been anointed king, hadn't told anybody. When it's time to say who it is, he ain't there. That's terrible English. But he wasn't there, was he? Okay, uh, so he knew what was coming. Who did Israel go to with their inquiry? The Lord, yes. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further. If the man should come thither. In their mind, this guy may not what? Well, if he's not here, he may not what? He may not want it. And if he doesn't want it, then should we really search out for him? Maybe, you know, we, maybe we need to find somebody else. And so they go to the Lord. Is that the place to go, folks, when we have inquiries? Pretty good lesson, isn't it? Got an inquiry, go to him. Where was Saul hidden? Yes, I love that. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. That's just a good Bible word, the stuff. Right? That's what we say a lot. Go get your stuff. Right? When you're going on a trip, not your luggage, not, you know, go get your stuff. Okay? Get all that stuff in your room put up. Uh, most likely it was all of the baggage and things of that nature. All Israel had come together for this gathering in Mizpah, right? So they traveled from a lot of places. So they had a central place where they dropped all the wagons, the animals, the baggage and things of that nature. And so that's where old Saul was, hidden out among all those things. Hoping what? Hoping not to be found. Yep, hoping not to be. Have you ever had a position like that? You know, this ain't a position that I really want, right? But yet, I'm about to get it. Unbelievable. Um, I wrote this down. Folks, it's humbling to be exalted to high and lofty positions, or at least it should be. You know that? It should be. How much higher did Saul stand above all the people? Verse 23. Yes, head and shoulders. They ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. Uh, he, folks, that means he was about a foot to a foot and a half taller than any other Jewish man. Is that pretty tall? That's like me standing beside Tim. Now see, y'all laugh. Y'all have hurt my feelings this morning. Don't think I could be president. Now I'm short compared to Tim, uh, but, but it's true, isn't it? I mean, he's a big guy, okay? Yeah, that's the one I was, yeah, that's the one I was talking about, old Tim Curtis. Um, so he's about a foot and a half uh, taller than, any, than, than the others. When Samuel showed Saul to the people, who did they say had chosen Saul? And Samuel said to the people, See ye him whom... The Lord hath chosen. That there is none like him among all the people. Now, the reason I bring this up is because later on, who is it going to be said had chosen Saul to be king? Well, 
Well, let me ask you this. Who's going to be the next king, the second king? David. What kind of king was he? He was the king after God's own heart, right? And uh, a lot of individuals think, well, Saul was the choice of the people. David was really the choice of who? God. Now, that, that, that's sort of true and sort of not true. You know, there, there's, it depends on how you're looking at this, okay? Folks, the reality is that God has the choice in all leaders of nations, okay? All leaders of nations. Now, take for instance the United States. Previous election, we had Barack Obama. Who chose him? Well, we did. We elected him. But guess who chose him? God did. Now we have President Trump. Who chose him? Who elected him? We did. But who chose him? God did. The Bible confirms that, doesn't it? Romans 13, verse 1, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Okay, now, is Saul going to turn out to be a good king? No, nobody, y'all haven't read your Bibles? Is Saul going to turn out to be a good king? No, he's going to fail miserably, and God's going to reject him. But listen to what the Bible says. See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen. But he's going to turn out to be a bad king. Okay, folks, we, we don't ever need to forget in our minds that God's in the process. Yes, sir. Sure. And see, God selected a man this time, this first time, that all of Israel would, would think is marvelous, right? He's big, he's tall, he's strapping, he stands head and shoulders above everybody else. He comes from a very prominent family, powerful family. He, he's the perfect candidate. So in that sense, it was their king. Because God knew what they wanted, but he turns out to be a flop, doesn't he? And he's rejected by God. And um, then, then he chooses David. And does David really look like a king that everybody would want? Little shepherd boy? You know, ruddy little guy, plays a harp, you know. If I went around playing a harp, do you want me to be your king? Okay. Um, but yet he's the what? Internally, he's the man, isn't he? He's the one after God's own heart. So, uh, you know, regardless, of what, I get, what I'm trying to say, regardless of what's going on, guys, in, in nations and kingdoms, always remember God's ultimately in charge of this. Okay? Well, no, we've seen a lot of other qualities that have been pretty positive. Well, God said uh, when, when, when he finally has to reject Saul, he says, when thou wast little in thine own sight. Okay? There was a time when Samuel was a very what? Humble man. Do you, do you want a humble man in office? That's, that's what you prefer, a very humble individual in office. And he told Saul, Saul, there was a time when when you first came to office of the king, you were, hum that you were little in your own sight. You understood. See, he's, where is he right now? He, he's hidden among the stuff. He isn't wanting to make this big public display of himself before individuals. He, he's little in his own sight, but he loses that in what takes over. Pride. He was obedient to his father. He had compassion upon his father. Worried about his father. There, there, there's just, he, he listened to his servant, took advice from his servant. He has a lot of good qualities, but sadly, when he got into leadership, pride overcame him, didn't he? And it became a very serious, uh, serious problem. Um, so uh, we have to be careful of that when individuals get into positions of power. Um, 
How did the people respond when they saw Saul? What? Yes, and the people shouted and said, God save the king! Now when you really look that up in the, in the uh, original Hebrew, here's the way it reads. May the king live or may the king prosper. Okay, so, so they're, they're, they're ready to accept him. Yes, this is the one we want. Put him in office. We're ready to go, right? So they're all behind him. And I note this next part. What did Samuel write in a book? The manner of the kingdom. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book. Now, in a previous chapter, God had told them about the manner of the king. Right? The manner of the king. The manner of the king was he would what? He'd take everything. Take your sons, your daughters, your property, tax you. He, he, your, your, your slaves, he, he just take everything. Right? That's the manner of the king. So what is this that he wrote in the book referring to the manner of the kingdom? He, I find it interesting that he just briefly notes it, wrote it in a book, and then it's passed over. What do you think he's talking about? Yeah, there's, it'd be interesting to go back and to see what Samuel wrote, wouldn't it? Folks, a kingdom has to be orderly, doesn't it? It has to have rules and laws that, that, that govern and guide it. It has to have, you know, certain things are prescribed to be done in certain ways. So Samuel was the man who wrote the manner of the kingdom. God doesn't give us all that, does he, in his holy word. We don't, we don't need all that, okay? I don't need to see how that kingdom was set up from top to bottom, start to finish. Uh, a lot of laws there, but it was written in a book, okay? Um, <clears throat> where did he put the book? Yeah, it just says, and laid it up before the Lord. Now, that's an interesting statement, isn't it? In Israel's mind, where was God? Huh? In the most holy place of the tabernacle. They didn't have the temple yet, right? Still just had the tabernacle. And God sat upon the mercy seat, where? In the most holy place. Okay? Now, they have the manner of the kingdom, and they laid it up before God. Somewhere in that tabernacle, the manner of the kingdom was put, folks. Okay? Somewhere. I, it doesn't say where. All it says is that he laid it up before God. Okay? And uh, we don't... There's just so little information that we have about that. Just some very brief statements. Uh, and I note this next thing. After Saul was shown to the people, what did Samuel tell the people to do? Yeah, just go home. <laughs> That's crazy, isn't it? And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. We're done. You got your king. <laughs> it, just, it just blows your mind. We get so wrapped up in so much stuff, right? And guess what, folks? We finally just go home and we just have our lives to live, don't we? You know? Israel's got their king. Now you know who he is. Now what do you want me to do? Go home. That's what I need you to do. Just go home. See? It's, it's just unbelievable. Who went with Saul to Gibeah? A band of men. And Saul also went home to Gibeah. I find that interesting. You know that? Saul just what? He took the same advice of everybody else. He just went home. Okay? He, he did, and, and we're going to find him in an interesting situation pretty soon, Okay? He doesn't, just, he doesn't go to a particular city and establish his kingdom and set up his throne. and do, he, just, he just what? He goes home to Gibeah. Was that the second bell? First bell, good. Y'all got to endure for three more minutes. And Saul also went home to Gibeah. And there went with him a band of men, now watch this, whose hearts God had touched. Man. There are three questions that come to mind when we think about these individuals. Number one, who are they? Number two, what were their responsibilities? Number three, 
How did God touch their hearts? It's interesting, isn't it? I don't know that we can answer any of them. They may have been friends of Saul. They may have been any number of men who had gathered to see Saul anointed as king. Um, but we do know this. They stand in contrast to a group of men who are who? Yes, the children are sons of Belial. Okay? So we do know that they were receptive of the new king and not in men who rejected the new king. We don't know their names. Next question. What were their responsibilities? Me no no. I know right now they escort him back where? Back home. You become king, guess what you immediately get? An escort, don't you? You get some folks around you. Um, they may have been some of Saul's closest advisors that were to come, okay, eventually. Um, they may have been extremely well-equipped military men, mightn't they? Folks, a king needs a good group of military men around him, doesn't he? Especially uh, in those days, well, really, at any time. How did God touch their hearts? It's toughy, isn't it? How did God touch their hearts? Um, there's two different ways that individuals talk about. First of all, it could have been simply by seeing this man as who? As the king. Okay? Uh, can God touch our hearts through non-miraculous means? Yeah, he can do that. Um, when, you, when you see the birth of a child and you see that little baby, God touches our hearts, doesn't he? Okay, nothing miraculous about it, just natural law, but God can touch our hearts. Uh, the act of kindness that somebody does for us, can, 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 God can touch our hearts through that. So they finally see the king and they see that he's a well-qualified man, a big man, a humble man, and so... God may have touched their hearts and said, you know, yep, this is the man that we need to get behind. Um, there's others who believe that when it says that he touched their hearts, it may have been some kind of a miraculous endowment placed upon these individuals to fulfill positions that they would ultimately assume in the kingdom. We're not told either way, folks. All we're told is what? God touched their hearts. And so they were men who were uh, on the side of who? On the side of Saul. All right? Who despised Saul that day? Yes. And the men of Belial said, who are these men of Belial? What's that word mean? Did you look it up? Yes. Without profit, worthless, wicked, good for nothing, unprofitable, base fellows. How shall this man save us? And despised him. Here's a lesson for leaders. You ready? Not everybody will love you. <laughs> Here's the very first king of the nation of Israel, and guess what? The sons of Belial, the Bible says, despised him. I wrote down this. Sometimes they are family. Sometimes they are friends. Sometimes they are people who just dislike us. Sometimes they are individuals who envy us, aren't they? True or false? Even though the children of Belial despised Saul, they brought him gifts. That's false. And then the last question. How did Saul respond to the actions of the children of Belial? But he held his peace. Folks, does he manifest another positive quality? Yeah. He could have easily destroyed those men. I'm now who? I'm king. Kill them. I don't need these men around me. Kill them. And guess what? He held his peace. Another positive quality he manifested.